a, a treat this morning, uh, being Christmas. The Lord worked it out that we're going to be focusing our attention as we continue our series on delighting in Christ. Uh, the last one is, is going to be next week on this series, uh, but we're going to focus our attention this morning on Jesus being both God and man. And uh, so should be a wonderful time as we focus in on this theme, and especially given that today is Christmas Eve, Merry Christmas to you, and uh, I pray that uh, the Lord would bless you today as we celebrate the birth of our King. Uh, let me open up in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your kindness and your goodness. Thank you for uh, sending your Son uh, to be clothed in humanity. Lord, the fulfillment of ancient promises that you've made to your people. And Lord, we come to you today and we ask that you would set our minds upon Christ. Help us, Lord, as we try and understand and uh, perceive a, a little bit more the, the glory of the incarnation as we see the Son of God becoming a Son of Man. And Lord, we ask that you would uh, encourage your people and bless them through your word. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. We're looking at God and man this morning. God and man. So we're going to... Well, first, first of all, a, a couple passages to kind of set the table uh, as regarding the, the theme and the wonder of this. And uh, again, pulling from John Owen, his book, Communion with God. And uh, where, what he does in, in his chapter uh, on this is uh, he not so much tries to explain the hypostatic union, that is the, the union between God and man in the person of Jesus Christ. Um, he, he doesn't do that so much. He does that elsewhere. But, but in this chapter, when he calls us to, to delight in Christ, he, he brings forth the, the benefits and the implications of Christ being both God and man. But he does set the table a little bit here, uh, reminding us in John 1, 1, in John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then a little bit later on in verse 14, it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. So the Word was with God in the beginning. The Word was God in the beginning, but... That word became flesh. So this eternal, uh, coexisting word becomes flesh in time and space, dwells among us, and we behold the glory of the word. We behold the glory of God uh, in the word become flesh. Not only this, but uh, Isaiah 6 Remember, Isaiah 6 is that vision that uh, Isaiah is given of the throne room of God. And he says, In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, with a train of his robe filling the temple. And it goes on with the cherubim, seraphim surrounding him and crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory, right? And we know from the Gospel of John that this is uh, Christ himself. This is the pre-incarnate Christ on his throne uh, all the way back in the Old Testament. And it's what, what's stunning is that this king, high and lifted up, this mighty one, is the same one spoken of later on in Isaiah, in chapter 9, verse 6. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us. And notice the, the kingly nature uh, that connects us back to the vision of Isaiah 6. The government will rest on his shoulders. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Those are four qualities 
of the king, Jesus Christ. As the government rests on his shoulders, as he rules this world, and as he promises to do so in the, in the age to come, in the millennium, he uh, is characterized by these four qualities. And what's stunning is that same king that was there on the throne in Isaiah 6 is also the king that is a child who will be born to us. A son will be given to us. Uh, I was listening to a sermon on this verse, and the preacher pointed out how uh, we see both the humanity and the deity uh, in Jesus Christ in this verse. We see a child will be born to us. That's very human, right? A child is born to us. But uh, the deity comes in on a son will be given to us. You see, this son did not come into being when he was born. He preexisted. Therefore, it can be said he was given. He existed before he was born of Mary, and he was given by the Father to us, uh, his people. And this, this, again, this hypostatic union, this, this union between both God and man in the person of Jesus Christ, this is uh, the wonder of all wonders in the Christian faith. John Owen said, says, Here lies the grace, peace, life, and security of, of the church, of all believers. If Christ is not both God and man, there is no grace, no peace, no life, no security for the people of God. Everything lies on this. And everything comes from this, right? Everything that is good in your relationship with God, it it comes from this reality of the God-man, Jesus Christ. So first of all, uh, what, is, what is one implication of, of uh, Christ being both God and man? Well, he is fit to suffer in our place. He's fit to suffer in our place. First of all, specifically in, in his death, he was fit to suffer in our place in, in taking our death on our behalf. Uh, a few verses, Matthew Chapter 20, verse 28 says, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. You see, uh, he came to give his life as a ransom. He came to give his life as a ransom. The payment, right? What's the payment of, what's, what's the payment? Or the wages of sin? Death. And humanity is the uh, group of people. It is humanity who is in sin, right? We sin. Uh, Dogs don't sin, right? Giraffes don't sin. Humans sin because we're moral creatures. Therefore, a human has to die. That's the payment. The, the ransom payment must, the, the payment must fit the crime, right? And so the ransom payment must, must be uh, the death of a human being. And th- that's a consequence of our sin. That's why we die. That's why there is judgment and hell for all eternity. That's why we as humanity goes there unless Christ saves us. Because we're the ones sinning. And so Christ had to be a man. And uh, in, in being a man, he was a fit ransom. Uh, Acts chapter 20, verse 28 as well. It says, be on, your, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. This is Paul speaking to the, to the leaders in Ephesus to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. Speaking of, well, who, as we just saw, 
who, who made this purchase with, with his own blood? It's Christ, right? But this his and the, and the he, right? Who's the, who's the immediate person being spoken of? It's God. So God purchased the church with his own blood. It can be said in this way. Now, we're not saying that uh, God died in the sense where he stopped being God. But God in the person of Jesus Christ makes this possible. Makes it possible that God would purchase the church with his own blood. And if it is God purchasing the church with his own blood, that blood, the payment, the ransom payment, is eternal and infinite and perfect. You see? He could not purchase us if, it, if Jesus was just a man. The ransom payment would not be enough if he was just simply another one of us. Uh, 1 John 3.16 says it a little bit different way. By this we have known love that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Christ laid down his life. Laid down his life for us. For us. For our benefit. I take this uh, for to be not in our place here, though that's said elsewhere, but here it's for the benefit. Because he calls us to lay down our lives for the benefit of our brothers. It's parallel. So, uh, Christ was fit to suffer and able to bear whatever was due Unto us, Owen says. Fit to suffer and able to bear whatever was due unto us. Uh, Owen says uh, this, that on this account, on this account, there, excuse me, was there room enough in his breast to receive the points of all the swords that were sharpened by the law against us. And strength enough in his shoulders to bear the burden of that curse that was due us. I mean, it's really well said, right? Uh, there was room enough, right, and strength enough. On, on what account? On, on, the, on the fact that Christ is both God and man. So here, Owen points out, he, he says it really beautifully that the... The, the, the swords of the law of God have been sharpened against humanity. And what does the point of a sword do but pierce and kill, right? Christ received the, the blow of the judgment of the law. And that's our next point. Uh, the sword of judgment. The sword of judgment. Just listen to these verses, dear saint. It says in Zechariah 13, 7, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, and against the man my associate, declares Yahweh of hosts. Strike the shepherd, that the sheep may be scattered, and I will turn my hand against the little ones. See, God is calling forth his judgment. And it's a judgment here specifically not against the people of God, but against the shepherd, against the associate, right? Against the Messiah, the God the Father's representative here on earth, which is Christ. And God as it were, summons and, and awakens his judgment prophetically here and, and calls his judgment to strike the shepherd. And the result is the sheep will be scattered. And we saw that with the disciples, right, when he was 
killed on the cross. Um, I mean, th- this, this has immediate implications for the nation of Israel in the context. It was talking about the king who was supposed to be shepherd, but he, he was doing a terrible job at it, and calling his, God was calling his judgment against that earthly king. But prophetically as well, this launches us forward into the New Testament where Christ, our king, uh, suffered the blow of the sword of God's judgment. And, and this sword, what, what is this sword? As I said, it's the sword of his judgment. But we get that from um, verses like Psalm 139, 19. In imprecatory psalm, Psalm 139, in verse 19 it says, Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. O oh, men of bloodshed, depart from me. Uh, the wicked... The, those who are rebels and haters of God are the just recipients of the judgment, the sword of judgment of God. And the psalmist here rightly calls on God, God, perform your justice, slay the wicked, judge them in your justice and righteousness. But what's stunning is that Christ stood in our place. He who what, knew no sin became sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And so as Christ hung there on the cross, he was treated. He didn't become wicked. He was treated as a wicked one like you and I. He was treated like a wicked one. And, and God the Father slew his son. He, he pierced him with the sword of his judgment there on the cross. And in so doing, when he did that, when Christ, as a man, took the punishment that was due towards sinful and wicked men, because he was God, he was able to withstand the eternal wrath of God's justice against sin. He was able to satisfy, not just take the, the blow, but to fully absorb and to remain standing, to survive the wrath of God, in a sense, though he died. Um, Hebrews, this is just stunning. This gets at, you know, the, uh, the importance of this man being God. Why is it so important that we emphasize the deity of Christ? Well, your salvation rests on it. Hebrews 1, verse 1 through 3 says, God, having spoken long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, talking about the, all the Old Testament in these last days, spoke to us in his son. The grammar is is final and complete. It's it's, uh, having spoken long ago is is a participle. So it's, it's, and it's um, imperfect. So it's it's an ongoing thing that was happening like a movie reel in the the Old Testament. But but in these last days, he spoke. And it's an aorist tense. It's a past tense. It's a full, final, complete action. It's saying, you know, in the Old Testament, God spoke this way, he spoke that way, and he spoke this way. And there was all different ways and times and seasons of him speaking to his people. But, but, but fully and finally and completely, God had the last word. And, 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 he, and he gave a, a, a final message, a final word to his people. And how did he do that? It's through his son. He spoke to us in his son. And it starts to describe this son, this, this uh, here, this, this perfect prophet, uh, sent one of God, uh, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. So it's setting Christ apart, isn't it? He's, he's the maker, he's a creator. Who is and and it, and it goes. You can see the escalation, right? Uh, heir of all things. Well, 
I think it's possible uh, just a human could be the heir of all things if God bestows that on, on somebody. But, but what about the, being the maker of the worlds? I don't think humanity can do that. And then, then the next step, he ratchets it up even, even more. Who is the radiance of his glory? Uh, sure, angels can radiate the, the glory of God, but it's a derived glory. It, they, they shine with the glory that uh, is um, from the presence of God. Uh, those shepherds in the field, the glory of the Lord, when the glory of the Lord shone around them, uh, you, you could say that uh, because the angels like Gabriel, it says in Matthew, that he stood in the presence of God, that uh, just like Moses did on, on the top of the mountain, remember when he came down, his face shone. And uh, so there, there is this sense where if you're in the presence of God, then you can... Um, uh, glow with his his with the radiant glory of him uh, for a time afterwards but not the next phrase this this is impossible of the human being the exact representation of his nature no human can be the exact representation of the nature of god no yeah only god can can claim because of the nature of god right his eternality, his, his omnipotence, his immutability, his omniscience, his perfections. In, in, in all, of his, all of those attributes, because those are attributes of God, only God can, can uh, possess the, ex, uh, the exact representation of that nature. It's so distinct, you see. And, and then it, it just keeps going. Who upholds all things, upholds all things by the word of his power. And it just gets more and more glorious. And then, after you know, just, just piling on attribute and, and, and accomplishment upon Christ, uh, the writer of Hebrews says, that's the one because of who he is, he accomplished cleansing for our sins. You see, it's that one who was able to, having accomplished, sit down in a sign of it's done, it's finished. And not, not only that, but sit down at the right hand of the majesty on high, no less. It's because he is who he is that he can accomplish, that is, fully and finally and completely accomplish the cleansing of our sins. If he was just a man, he could not do that. Our salvation would not have been accomplished. But because he is God in flesh, he has. And one last one. Uh, as the sword of God's righteous judgment... Pierce the Son of God. It is by those wounds which we are healed. First Peter chapter 2, verse 24. Who himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that having died to sin, we might live to righteousness. By his wounds you were healed. What were those wounds inflicted with? The sword of God's judgment. And, and those wounds uh, are healing wounds. From those wounds flow the blood of Christ to heal us, to, to, to heal the, the destruction of sin, both in this life and the life to come. Now, he is fit to be uh, in our place. He is fit to um, suffer in our place as the God-man. He is also, secondly, fit to be a fountain of grace as the God-man. We've, this has been kind of a common theme, the, the grace of God in and through Christ. Uh, but it kind of culminates here in the person work of Christ as, as the God-man. Because uh, think of it this way. 
our access to the eternal graces uh, of God, our access to the eternal graces of God is found in Christ. It's found in Christ. Christ purchased those graces that are for us, and we cataloged that last week. Christ is the eternal storehouse of all of the graces of God, all of the grace of God. Remember, for all those situations and times and seasons in your life, for whatever kind of need, every kind of grace is found from God, but they're found in the eternal storehouse of Christ himself. Think of it this way, a fountain is good, especially when it is always flowing with fresh water. That's a good thing. But what good is that fountain to us if we cannot dip our hand in it and quench our thirst? What good is it if it is behind uh, locked gates or in a, in, in a landscape that is inaccessible to humans? What good is that fountain? Flowing as it is. Christ is both an eternal and ever flowing fountain of grace to us as God and as human, He is accessible to us by His humanity. So you have both the eternal fountain of all grace and access. You can dip your hand and quench your thirst. Uh, first, or excuse me, John one sixteen. Uh, we it's, it's a familiar verse in this series. For of His fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. It only says that we are able to receive of His fullness after saying in verse fourteen, the Word became flesh. Right. So you have the eternal fountain of all grace in in John one verse one through three. In the beginning was God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and so on. Verse 14, it says, that Word became flesh. And only after that Word became flesh can we say of His fullness we have all received. You see, the grace is now accessible to you in Christ. Colossians 2 says it a different way. I think a little bit more clearly or succinctly. For in Him... All the fullness of deity dwells bodily, and in him you have been filled, who is the head over all rule and authority. There's an intentional parallel here, right? In him and in him, right? But also, fullness and have been filled. There, the, it's, it's, it's the same Greek word, just said a different way. So in him, there is all the, the, the fullness of deity, and in him, you have been filled. In him is that eternal fountain of all grace, and in him, you drink deeply. You see? So... Now, what kinds of grace? Just kind of continuing on, explaining more and more the, the, what we have in Christ. What, what do you have access to? Well, first, Christ is where we find life. Christ is where we find life. 1 Corinthians 15, 45. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last, Adam, became a life-giving spirit. The last Adam, that's speaking of Christ in the, in the context. The last Adam, uh, he's not the second Adam, he's the last Adam. The last uh, head of a, you could almost say, a new humanity, a new people, a new race. Well, the, the Bible calls us that, doesn't it? Uh, this last Adam, Jesus Christ, became a life-giving spirit. Remember the first Adam in Genesis 
2, he was given life by God. And by God's fiat, by God's powerful work, he was given life and he became a living soul. The last Adam, Christ, uh, is not just a, a living soul, but, but even a life-giving spirit. So he didn't just, he's not just like the first Adam uh, in that he is living, but he is the God-man because he gives life. He's a giver of life. And in John eleven twenty five, 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. Christ is where we find life, and that life is an eternal life. It is a life that begins in this age but extends into eternity. Notice, it's, it's, he's the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. So it doesn't say that, he will li- that you will live after you die. That, e- that life that Christ gives isn't something that, is, that you're waiting for and don't have yet, and it's in heaven somewhere, and you, you have to die to get it. You have that life now, and that life will not be extinguished. Though you die, that life that you have in Christ will not ever be extinguished. It will, you will live even when you die. You'll be ushered into eternity. You have that in Christ, Christian. Not only this, but Christ is the joy of our hearts. He is the joy of our hearts. You want joy this morning? Do you need joy? Go to Christ. 1 Peter 1.8 And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Because you place your faith in Christ, you now are able to rejoice. You are able to rejoice with a joy that is inexpressible. It's an inexpress- it, 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 there are, aren't there times in your life, Christian, where there, you're just flooded with joy, the joy of the Lord, and you just can't put words to it? Amen. And those, those times, sadly, are not, for many, not every day. And, and there might be a long seasons of I don't have that inexpressible joy I have joy in the Lord because I'm his and I love him and he loves me and there's this there is this settled uh, unchangeable joy in the soul of the Christian but this joy this inexpressible joy this this joy that's full of glory uh, sometimes I don't feel that I don't I don't I don't think I have that but but Christian it's by faith right how do you get that joy? It's, it's by leaning into your faith in Christ, reminding yourself of the truths of him and all that he is for you and setting your, the, the eyes of faith upon your beloved one. And that's why he says, though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him. So that, that love and that faith for Christ, right? That's, that's what he's talking about. You love him, and you do not see him, but you believe in him. So your love and your faith in Christ uh, gives you joy. And, and sometimes you have to love Christ by faith, right? And, and, but Christian, it, it is well worth the fight. To get into the word, to get into prayer, and to rehearse the truths of Christ, the grace of Christ and the gospel for you. His shepherding and caring work in your life today. To remind yourself of all the promises that are, are yes in Christ. As your heart fills with love, as you begin to uh, really take him at his word, really believe in him, God will give you joy. It may even be an inexpressible joy, a joy that's glorious, full of glory. And that's why Paul can say in Philippians 4, 4, 
I command you to rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. That's why God can command joy. Because joy is the product of love and faith in Christ. Fight for joy, Christian. Don't let joy just come to you. It's not how it works. It's not how it works. It doesn't just zap you or just come out of left field. He he tells us, rejoice, do it. How do you do that? By setting your affections on him, by setting your trust in him. It will be a joy that uh, this world doesn't understand and then cannot give, just as his peace is. All right, also, Christ uh, gives relief from sin. Christ gives relief from sin. In Christ, one of the graces that is a result of, uh, that, that we find in him uh, in our lives is, Owen oh, calls, a relief from sin. Uh, first of all, from the guilt of sin, right? Relief from the guilt of sin. First John 1 John 1.7. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. But not only this, uh, judicially and uh, uh, as far as the guilt and, and the stain of sin, Christ gives relief from that, but also from the tyranny of sin, from the sin's rule and uh, uh, sway in our lives. Romans 8, 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. So there are two laws, right? Uh, think of it as um, laws of nature. And, uh, one, the law of nature is what goes up must come down, right? It's just gravity. Uh, if you're here on earth, you're... You're subject to the laws of nature, whether you like it or not. You're subject to gravity, whether you like it or not. Um, And you live under those laws of nature. You're bound, you're uh, limited, uh, you're you're bound to that law, those laws of nature. So also, in a sense, there are two laws here. Spiritually, there is a law of sin and death. The law of sin and death. Uh, that is uh, this bondage to sin. The, there was this bondage of sin, just like um, the, the Israelites had in Egypt, their bondage to Pharaoh, that he was a harsh tax, taskmaster. Uh, so also sin is a harsh taskmaster. It it promises you joy and happiness, but ends up making you, you know, make bricks without straw. It makes the job harder, right? Make, it always keeps that joy and happiness just out of reach. It's, it's never attainable fully. It's a harsh taskmaster. And uh, sinful man, fallen humanity, is subject to that law whether they like it or not. And they're limited and controlled by that law as, as gravity. But so also, you've been set free from that in Christ. And you have been placed into this other law, the law of the spirit of life in Christ. That is, uh, the law has been written on your heart. You've been given a new heart. That's regeneration. It's a new covenant. In the new covenant, you have been given uh, a new heart that willingly, love, uh, lovingly uh, submits to the law of God. Christ says, come to me and, uh, and, and I will give you rest. Yeah, but, but there is a yoke and there is a burden, but, but that yoke is easy and the burden is light, he says, right? But there is a yoke and there is a burden. There is a slavery. God told, spoke of his people in Exodus, remember, how 
I will, he said, I will deliver you from slavery to Pharaoh and to Egypt, and you will be my slaves. So it's not just liberation theology where you're just bound and then now you're free to do whatever you want. No, you are set free from the law of sin and death and then placed under a new law, the law of, of the spirit of life in Christ. And it's a good... It's a good rule. It's a good reign that you have. It, 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 there is relief from sin in Christ. Uh, that, that reality of having a harsh taskmaster, you are relieved from that. Now you have a good king, a good master. Um, also, Christ gives deliverance from the wrath to come. He gives deliverance from wrath. Uh, Romans 5, 9, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Romans 5, 9, then of course, 1 Thessalonians 1, 10, and wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. This is what Jesus does. This is who he is. This is part of his uh, identity. This is part of how we see him and relate to him. He, he's our rescuer. He rescues us from the wrath to come. Amazing how it can be said that he, in, in one passage, in Romans 5, 9, um, and it, well, actually in other passages that we have been saved, right? Um, here, he is saving us. He is rescuing us from the wrath to come. And in Romans 5, 9, we shall be saved from the wrath to come. So the salvation of Christ, his deliverance, his rescue, is, is, is all-encompassing from beginning to end. That's the idea. That you have been saved from the guilt, and, and you, you are being saved from the tyranny, and you will be saved from the uh, judgment uh, for sin. Uh, another quote from Owen, kind of summing this point up. All grace becomes his, that is, at his disposal. And he bestows it on or works it in the hearts of his people by the Holy Ghost according to his infinite wisdom as he sees it needful. So what he's saying is Christ purchased grace for us, all these graces, all these these helps and, and, and kind workings of God in your life, all of these become His because He earned them in His life, and He bestows it upon those. He, he works it on His people by the Holy Spirit, and He does that according to His wisdom. As He sees your need, He gives you a specific grace for that need. That is, uh, He mediates our grace is part of his mediation work. He takes the, the grace and the, and the goodness and all the resources of God, he takes that into himself and he pours them out upon his people through the Holy Spirit. It's his great mediatorial work. Lastly, speaking of which, Christ is fit to be our mediator. He is fit to be our mediator. And this is and glorious, I wish I had more time, but we don't. Uh, John Owen, uh, he says, speaking of Christ as mediator, he says, herein shines out the infinitely glorious wisdom of God. And I like this, which we may better admire than express. So when it comes to Christ as our mediator, uh, we do a better job just hearing the, the verses and admiring the wisdom of God in the mediatorial work of Christ. We do a better job just sitting back and being in awe than we do expressing and explaining it. Uh, so, uh, there's my disclaimer <laughs> for my uh, lack of ability to fully explain Owen says but we won't be able to fully explain you, you do a better job just admiring Christ as mediator than express, expressing and explaining it but uh, 
First of all, the need for a mediator. It's important to set that groundwork. Job 9, verse uh, 30 to 33 is so helpful. As Job is being uh, um, just dealt with um, by God through uh, the devil, uh, God allows the devil to um, persecute, in a sense, Job. Um, not because Job has done anything wrong, though he's not perfect, but simply because God wants to prove a point in the life of Job. And uh, Job is dealing with accusations, and, and his friends are saying, well, you, you must have sinned, you must have just blown it somewhere, that's why you're suffering, obviously. But it's not so obvious at times, is it? And Job is, you know, he's, he's pleading his case that he hasn't sinned, as far as he knows, in, in, in a way that, that earns this kind of discipline from God. But at the same time, he, he juggles that with, but I know I'm a sinner, and I know that I do sin, but I, I don't think I've sinned uh, in, a, in a way that uh, God would discipline me in this way. My, my conscience is clear, but I know I'm a sinner too. And so he's juggling those two tensions, those two realities. And he says, If I should wash myself with snow and cleanse my hands with lye, yet you would plunge me into the pit, and my own clothes would abhor me. That is, I would be so sinful, such a wretch. My, the clothes that I wear... Uh, would be disgusted with me. Wow. And, and that's after I try and cleanse myself with snow and, and cleanse my hands with lye. All right, that's after I try and scrub my soul with Clorox bleach. And uh, he says, look, I, I know I'm a sinner. And he says in verse 32 and 33, for he, that is God, He's talking about his relationship with God and God as judge. He is not a man as I am, that I may answer him, that we may go to court for judgment together. Right? I'm not going to be so bold as to say, you know what, God, you're wrong for allowing this to happen. I'm not going to accuse him of wrongdoing. Far be it. I know I'm a sinner, but I, I, I don't know what I've done. But I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna go so far as to say, you know, God. You know, God is wrong in doing this, and I don't deserve this. Or, or I'm not gonna gonna demand a, uh, uh, an answer from God. Demand that He answer for Himself to me. I'm not gonna pull Him into court and question Him. I'm not gonna put Him on the witness stand and interrogate Him. Because why? Because he's not a man as I. He's God. I'm a, I'm a man. How can I do that to him? There's this infinite chasm between him and I. And he says, there is no adjudicator between us who may lay his hand upon us both. That is, there is no uh, referee. There is no uh, go-between. There's no, uh, th this word is adjudicator uh, is also translated as mediator, uh, umpire, or moderator. So Job understands his need. I can't, I can't go to God and accuse him of wrongdoing. I can't, I can't even pull him into court to, to, to answer for what's going on in my life. Because there's this, this infinite gap between me and him because he is God and I am man. And he says, oh, if there was an, an adjudicator, if there was somebody in between who, who can stand between God and man and, and lay a hand on God and lay a hand on sinful man and, and, pro, and, and, and provide an answer and provide uh, restoration and reconciliation... You see, Job is crying out for that, in a sense. He sees his need for that. There is a great, great need for a mediator between God and man. 
And this has been man's cry since long ago, the time of Job. Now, the, the, the glory is that Christ is that perfect mediator because he is both God and man. He can, like Job cried out for, he can lay his hand upon us both. How can Christ do that? How can Christ lay his hand, as it were, on God and lay his hand on man and be that bridge? Because he is both God and both man. And man. Because he is both, he can lay his hand upon both. He can, pro- he can provide reconciliation between both. He is the perfect mediator. A, a few verses. And again, we do a better job at just admiring this than explaining it. As Owen said, Romans 8.34, Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God who also intercedes for us. So what's our cry in, in, when the accuser accuses us? When our conscious, conscience cries out to us and, and, and judges us? condemns us, our cry is Jesus Christ. It, it, it's, it's, he died and, and was raised, and he's at the right hand of God, and he's praying for me. He's interceding for me. He's mediating for me. I don't deserve to have a relationship with God, and I can't earn a relationship with God, but I have something, somebody in between me and God. That's the God-man, Jesus Christ. Hebrews 12, uh, verse 22 to 24, it says, But you have come to Mount Zion, and the city of the living God, and it goes on, and then lastly, and you have come to Jesus, the mediator of uh, of a new covenant. You have come to the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. So in the gospel, by faith, we have come to Jesus, who is the mediator of the new covenant. All the promises of the new covenant. Such as, I will be your God, you will be my people for all eternity. I will give you a new heart. I will remove the heart of stone, give you a heart of flesh. Um, The promises of, uh, I will write my law upon your heart. I will put my spirit within you. All of those promises, I, uh, I will cast your sins behind me, and I will remember them no more. I will forgive you of all your sins. All those new covenant promises are mediated in Christ. That is, Christ earned them by his life, death, burial, and resurrection, and he dispenses those benefits of the covenant, the promises of the covenant, to his people by the Holy Spirit. And then, of course, 1 Timothy 2.5. There is one God, one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And that says it all, doesn't it? There's one God. And there's one mediator between God and man. There's one umpire. There's one uh, uh, moderator. There's one adjudicator between God and man. And that is the man Christ Jesus. And this is what we celebrate, that, uh, especially during this time of Christmas, that God became flesh, God became man, clothed himself with humanity to be the perfect mediator in our place. Uh, Owen, again, how glorious is he that is the beloved of our souls, let us dwell on the thoughts of this. That is the, 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 the nature of, of Christ being both God and men. He says, let us dwell on the thoughts of this. This is the hidden mystery. Great without controversy. Admirable to eternity. I like this. It's convicting. What poor, low, perishing things do we spend our contemplations on? Uh, He goes on, it's excellency, glory, beauty, and depths. That is the excellency, glory, beauty, and depths of the God-man. 
deserves the flower of our iniquities, or excuse me, the flower of our inquiries, the vigor of our spirits, and the substance of our time. So Christian, I, 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 am, I implore you, I, I exhort you, do not spend your thoughts this week, especially today and tomorrow. Do not spend your thoughts on poor, low, and perishing things. Especially those things that are wrapped under the tree, right? Rather, spend your thoughts the flower of your inquiries, the vigor of your spirits, the substance of your time. Spend your thoughts today and tomorrow, especially dwelling upon the God-man, Jesus Christ. Think often of Christ today and tomorrow, dear saint. Think often of the wonder that he is both God and man. And as both God and man, Christ alone is fit to suffer in our place, fit to be a fountain of grace, and fit to be our mediator. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you in your great wisdom and great power has caused it to be that your only begotten Son, the Eternal One, would, would become one of us. And even to the point of dying on the cross in our place as one of us even to suffer the wrath of God as one of us. And because he has accomplished our salvation, Father, we go to your Son for everything that we could ever need and everything we could ever want. And Lord, thank you for standing between us and deity. Thank you for uh, being our perfect mediator, Lord Jesus. We ask that you would, by your Holy Spirit, flood our minds and our affections with these truths, especially as we uh, give them special attention today and tomorrow. May that be our focus above all. May it be the overarching theme of our thoughts. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.